We're live. I don't mind. This is on YouTube, so you know it could go viral. <laughs> I'm going to get up in a second. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right, we'll call the Board of Trustee meeting uh, to order to the May 25th, 2023 meeting. Madam President, before we proceed with the uh, meeting tonight, I'd like to just take a moment and um, extend our condolences from the Board of Trustees to our head basketball coach, Matt Brown, and his wife, Nikki. Um, they lost their son, Cohen, after a long battle of cancer. Um, so we need to take a moment and keep them in our prayers and thoughts at this time. Thank you. All right, so uh, looking at the agenda, I need an approval for the agenda of printed. Approved. Okay. All say aye. 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 Do we have any citizens' comments? We have no comments. All right, introduction of some new employees. We do have some new employees to introduce, and first on the list, Dr. Uh, Michael Murders, if he's not spending over drinks back there, <laughs> would like to introduce some uh, uh, some new staff in his area. Yes, so um, not originally on your list, so uh, I was remorse and, and not uh, remiss, rather, in not adding uh, new folks to new positions, and I wanted to introduce them tonight to the board. Um, so in our quest to continually improve our uh, tech ed division and structure and hiring the dean, we've also decided that with, the, with that structure, we're going to, um, with the loss of a division chair, we were going to split those duties in order to, and even to have two. And so we have both division chairs uh, here tonight, Jenny <laughs> So and Misty Burnett. And so they come, uh, obviously been with us for quite a while and, and are gonna move up and, and take on additional responsibilities. And really with that technical education division and the, the breadth of the responsibilities, the business economics and computer science aspect and the advanced manufacturing technology and then together that overlap, um, those two will, will bring those, those skill sets to us. I think take us up another notch and support us. Uh, our future new dean. So we're really excited. And they've already been running with this for the last several weeks. So wanted to at least uh, introduce them. Um, we look also, forward to your leadership. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. They're, they're doing great. Um, also, new to you, but not new to us in a way. She's been here since February. This will make a little sense in a minute. <laughs> Miss Allie Robinson. Um, she, uh, she is actually. Uh, the administrative assistant for the division five or the technical education division. And so she's been here since February, but we were uh, struggling to find someone for that position when Shelly left it, when I stole Shelly for the VP support. And so uh, we were lucky to work through a uh, temporary service and find that late. And she, so she joined the temporary service. So she's officially, as of May 15th, she works for State Fair Community College, drawing our paycheck, and which is, is great. But she's been here since February, been running, uh, doing a fantastic job, and she's being mentored and coached by Shelly. So that we all think that's a great thing. And if Shelly's on here, that's a huge compliment, even if Mr. Carr says something negative. Um, <laughs> um, but we are glad to have her, and, and she's she's flying, just doing all kinds of things for us. So she's running. Welcome, Welcome Allie. Welcome. And uh, health sciences, Dean Brush. 
Hello, I am happy to introduce Miss Missy Lunch. She's with us on Zoom today. Missy, you want to give a wave? Missy is our administrative assistant at the Clinton campus. So our GEARS grant, our Surge Tech GEARS grant is getting us started with Missy. And she is taking over for Abby Tribble, who's moved over into the coordinator role at Clinton campus. Um, so we're super excited to have her. Um, she's from the Clinton area. She knows a lot of people in Clinton, um, and she's been a joy to work with so far. So welcome to the team, Missy. Welcome, Missy. Welcome, welcome, Missy. Hey, Kelly. I get the pleasure of introducing you to Trenton Hammonds. Trenton's our newest member of our facilities department as a maintenance tech. And I called him and he's hit the ground running. So. Glad you're on board. Thank you. Good morning. around and sing around campus. Welcome. Trent well, wanted to give a speech tonight, but I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bates, I have someone who's not on, didn't make it on the list, primarily because he's hired in October. So in a period of time when there, there wasn't a dean, there weren't folks to do an introduction, allow me to now finally introduce you um, to Curtis Street. Curtis is our TRIO director. Um, he came to us from New Mexico, from New Mexico Tech, where he was the um, TRIO Upward Bound director for six or seven years. Um, he's been here, he's wrapped his arms around that team, he's turned the program into his own. He's the dad of three ridiculously cute little boys, right? Uh, which only adds value all the way around. Um, anything else you want to add at all? I love St. Paris. So happy to be here. We finally bought a house, so we were set like Thursday. The full tie dye um, instruction by the tie oh, cage, right? <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Okay. That's it. Okay. Okay, moving on the agenda for the approval of the minutes from the April 27th of 2022 board meeting. Um, you had was out earlier. No the objections, I'll be pushed to approve. Okay. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say aye. Okay, so now we're ready for the warrant for the April 2022 meeting. <laughs> For the month of April 2023, disbursement from the college for $4,199,605. Um, as you see there, uh, larger payments were $1.853 and that's payable. So we had $69,900 was the Westport to stop her from innovation and $230,000 contained to <clears throat> lease maintenance structures for building innovation and the rest. They're doing the payroll in the virtual of four of them on the months until possible. Good. Are we going to take a motion to accept that? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Dr. Burgers, do you want to introduce Sarah? Or? <laughs> I don't know if she needs introductions, but <laughs> definitely deserves it. Uh, Ms. Bigler is obviously our extended campus director at Clinton. Um, she has been uh, a role model, a mentor, a coach for all our other directors and continues to lead. Um, in addition to just just always working and always doing something, she is she has been a huge part. And I, I know Dr. Porter would mm -hmm. would would echo um, <laughs> and applaud. Um, she and Bethany um, have been instrumental in our ability to continue doing some so um, uh, not only the reevaluating our process for admission enrollment, but they picked up the slack from the extended campuses and doing much of the admissions and enrollment work that was necessary when Dr. Porter got here and was trying to build their team. And they continue to do that. They're continuing. They're actually our experts in many ways in doing these things. So, so Dara and um, and of course with Bethany, they just they complement each other. But with the, it, it, it to me it, it says a lot that we can have two leaders from our extended campus have such an effect on our daily work here on this. So it shows how our institution is truly aligned, and and we have great folks. At all. It takes great folks even at our extended sites just to to make it continuous improving here. So. Um, Further ado, uh, without further ado, Ms. Dara Bigler, do you take the show? Because this is this is your time. <clears throat> All right. 
Thank you. Well, that concludes this presentation. You just did a great <laughs> job of sharing. No, uh, kidding. I, I joked with Lisa earlier that um, uh, Dr. Bates made it clear that uh, Bethany set the precedence when it came to presentations for extended campus. And I was her mentor. So I feel like everything she said times two um, would be um, taken forward. So I'm going to share my screen here with you and make sure that we're all seeing the same thing. All right, are you seeing SFCC Clinton? Yes. Perfect, okay. Um, so of course I am the director for the Clinton campus. Um, I started my career with State Fair back in uh, July of 2003. Um, I was 12, not really, but um, it, it just seems like yesterday. And when you come to a job that you love and um, and you feel like you're making a difference in, um, that makes a huge impact. It doesn't seem like work, you know, so that's um, important to me. When I started, we were at Clinton Technical School. We offered, um, we had about 12 students and six ITV classes at that time. I was fortunate enough to get to grow up along with the Clinton campus, you know, working on my own degree. Um, for you, those of you that don't know, my husband was a state trooper who was injured in the line of duty back in 1996. And that kind of uh, shook up our life a little bit. So I was really, um, you know, a young mom, a young wife, and I wasn't really sure what direction I was going to take. If you'd have asked me then, I'd have told you I was never going to work in education because my mother worked in education. So there you go. Here we are today. Um, we have a fantastic team here at the Clinton campus. I've listed their names here for you. Um, hopefully I didn't forget anybody because that's not my intent. Um, Abby's our assistant director. Michelle Slater is our navigator. Missy Lund, who of course you just met also. Laura works part-time with us um, as an English tutor and also helps us with some things in Slate um, and processing student applications. Bill is our maintenance and security guy. He keeps our building in tip-top shape and um, uh, is that evening layer for us as well. Sarah Mulder and Farah, they are full-time instructors for us. Sarah teaches math and Farah in biology. And then we get to our health science family. Well, yes, they report to Allison. Um, they're still part of this crew here as well. Dr. Meg Beebe, Becky Herman um, with nursing, Michelle Green, Sarah Coslett with surgical tech, Jill Samal, Bailey Coleman, who are with medical assisting. We have six fantastic peer mentors on staff with us that help us with a lot of things. Emily, Alyssa, Noah, Keith, Ashlyn, and Callie, and about 30 adjunct instructors. So um, I truly consider them family, and um, they help make the Clinton campus what it is. So. Okay, so let's talk enrollment. Um, IT helped us put together this uh, dashboard uh, probably within the last couple of years uh, because we were we kind of fight this little bit of a struggle because we serve more students at the Clinton campus that are enrolled elsewhere versus just what's enrolled on our campus. Um, summer, I don't know if anybody else worries about it, summer except for extended campus. And I say that jokingly because it's kind of considered, you know, a little icing on the cake. Um, we are up for summer. Um, it's slight, but it's still an increase. I hope that we see that residual when it comes to our fall enrollment um, as well. You can see by this, these graphs, we have a huge number of online students. Um, who um, aren't necessarily in seat with us, but are in online classes or at other locations. Dara, can you explain the graphs? Because we can't see the descriptions on what it is. Okay, so let me take this middle box for you here, okay? So this is giving us headcount um, at various locations, okay? So our dark blue here that shows the 7%, that is Boonville Web Conference. So I have six students who are enrolled for summer in a web conference class at Boonville, okay? Um, this five here is actually on site at Clinton, our Clinton web conference here. Um, Sedalia, the M, the main campus, 17. We have four that are enrolled in um, web conference out of Sedalia for summer. We have 49 students who are enrolled online. And then coming back around to the top with the red, that is um, Whiteman Web Conference. So I have five students that are enrolled in a Whiteman Web Conference class. So it's tied to students who have a Clinton site code, but we wanted to see where they were funneling out to. Because again, they're not just sitting in the seats on our campuses. Um, we have these same reports available for Boonville, uh, Whiteman, and the Lake Campus to give that same breakdown. Thank you. Does that help? Yep. Okay. 
So when we're looking at fall, my fall numbers for fall of 22, this gives where we landed as of census. So 186 students, um, 1840 as far as our credit hours. We have experienced a downturn the last couple of semesters. Um, the fall of 2020 was very nice to us because at that time, Clinton was the only extended campus site that was offering web conference. Um, so we had a lot of influx um, there at that time. Then I kind of had to start sharing the love with the other campuses, which should happen. That should happen, of course. Um, so we're continuing to try to turn that around. Dr. Bates, one of my favorite questions he asked when enrollment is up, what are you doing? What are you doing when enrollment's down? I feel like my answer is all the same. We're always looking for the why behind it um, and always trying to unearth something new and different um, that's going to help bring that around. I do think it's interesting that in our fall numbers, um, again, I'm going to reference this middle box, 34% are showing enrolled online for fall. We also have, if you total up all the web conference numbers there in the middle box, 34% are also attending web conference courses across locations. So I think that is interesting with web conference and gives a little, um, uh, a little grip um, to that as well, that it is a popular modality for our students and we'll continue to work to improve that. Questions on this? What is web conferencing? Um, web conferencing, so um, it is charged at the on-ground tuition rate. Students have the option to connect off campus from home via Zoom. Um, some of our classes run blended so that they teach to a seated environment and a Zoom student environment. Um, we have worked to kind of reduce some of those blended environments and just have students on Zoom. Um, but uh, Clinton, we kind of started that initially um, and and Clinton kind of helped to spearhead that because we saw low enrollment classes across extended campus locations. You know, um, whatever kind of class, maybe I'd have three that needed it and Boonville had two and the lake had five. Well, it's hard for us to run those with those numbers individually, but if we combine and we've got a class of 12 or 14, that looks different. Um, COVID kind of took the rule book and ripped it up, threw it out the window, um, but it really helped my staff be ready for that transition. When we had to make that pivot during COVID, they picked up, taught right on via web conference, and then um, carried that forward moving into the fall semester that year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So extended campus, not too many people ever leave extended campus. Let me tell you why. <laughs> um, I feel like uh, we have one of the best views of the institution, a 20,000 foot view. Um, I, even with um, our work with web conference, our work with Slate, um, I hope that that's some of the value that we've brought to the table is that um, we can see where impacts might be in different areas uh, because of all the areas that we're able to touch. Uh, we are an extension of several Sedalia campus offices. We can't do our job without the support from those areas. Amy Schrader in testing and her crew, Angel Mefford in financial aid, the admissions group, um, all sorts of areas. We're just an extension, uh, but we have to have them standing behind us and, um, and supporting us to be able to support our students, which they do. Um, I think we share the perspective of whatever it takes, whatever needs done, uh, we're happy to step in and, and try to make it happen. Um, the last thing, that small team with big goals. Um, overall, I know there was a long list of people on that first page, uh, but as far as facility management for us, it really comes down to a team of four and a half, you know, managing a facility, a schedule, um, staff, all of that. So, um, and I said high expectations. Um, I feel like we have high expectations for our crews um, and I'm always asking a little bit more. So we got some really good news and this was probably already shared, but I have to share it again because it made me very happy. Um, JC Smith, um, who was pivotal in securing this facility um, that we're currently in uh, with care organization, which then turned into true CDC. Um, he was pivotal in the year to nursing expansion, track two here at the Clinton campus. He passed away in April of 21. Here a couple of months ago, I got a phone call from a local attorney. I try not to take a lot of phone calls from attorneys because they make me nervous. Um, and he's like, no, he's like, uh, I said, what can I do for you? He's like, mm, it's not what you can do for me. It's what I'm going to do for you. Um, I, thought everything was settled with JC and his estate. And he made some wonderful donations in the community. And that's when they came forward and let us know um, that he left $1.2 million in furtherance of the nursing program at the Clinton campus. 
So we continue um, to work on what that's gonna look like. There's a group of community members here and also uh, from State Fair. Um, I think we will lean toward naming the foundation or the governing body that helps with those funds um, in his name because he has such a legacy here in the community that I think it will continue to cultivate additional donations as that moves forward. So uh, just to highlight JC, uh, we sure appreciate him leaving that as part of his legacy. Junior Summit, uh, some of you were present for this. Um, Clinton High School, this is the second year that they have sent over juniors, all of their juniors to the Clinton campus, which puts about 130 people, 130 juniors here. We had opportunity to represent eight of the 14 sessions seven sessions in the morning, seven in the afternoon. It is like speed dating, okay? Um, and we had representation from Rochelle Hockett, Abby Tribble, Sarah Manuel, Carrie Young, Allison Ingram, Carrie Young, Michelle Slater, um, Curtis Grice, and Jennifer Hubbs. So from financial aid to trio information to uh, being smart with social media, it really gave us an opportunity to be upfront uh, with these students. During their lunch, we had surgical tech, nursing, medical assisting, we're all set up, kind of giving them some little hands-on demonstrations. Uh, but we thank Lindy Johnson at Clinton for this opportunity with the Ayers Foundation, and we look forward um, to this event again next year. We were all exhausted by the end of the day, but it was so much fun. Now, Dr. Porter might help me out with this story just a little bit, because it's just too funny not to share also. So we joined uh, Clinton High School for Decision Day. Um, here not too long ago, one of our peer mentors uh, jumped in the roadrunner suit there and he comes back and he's like, there's another mascot there. It was a coyote. He was like trying to challenge me and trying to, we're like, coyote, whose mascot is a coyote? Okay. Finally, he says he had KC on his shirt. And Dr. Porter, Dr. Porter and I were like, oh my Oh, bless his cotton socks. Yeah, you were up against Casey Wolf from the Kansas City Chiefs. So, um, but it was a fun day. Again, he was there to help represent for her state fair and the students who were headed our way. Um, Michelle Slater also joined over there just a couple of weeks ago. We did on-site enrollment with their first time freshmen, which again, kind of got some questions from students who hadn't decided where they were headed to. Uh, just great exposure uh, for state fair. Clinton Technical School, uh, we continue to cultivate efforts with their uh, PN program. Their program starts in January and runs through December. It's a huge recruiting opportunity for our year two program. Previously, we have hosted them in the spring, brought them on campus. Uh, we had a faculty panel, a student panel, um, some displays that were set up, community organizations. We're moving that to the fall this year and we'll continue with the same type thing um, with the faculty panels and student panels, but we're also gonna really highlight um, community resources. That kind of came from a conversation with Marla Gaston, who is their program director. And she said, you know, they're already starting to get questions about, you know, food resources, housing resources, utility resources. Um, she said, you know, so if we can pull in some of those entities to kind of help um, educate them on what's available um, and where they might refer individuals. So we're continuing to develop that. And I have to put this in about the EMT program because if you have not heard me mention paramedic before, uh, Dr. Murders, Dr. Bates, I probably drive them crazy with that. Allison, um, the Clinton Technical School is rolling out their EMT program starting in fall afternoon and morning sessions are both full and they're looking our way going, what you got for us next? And I'm like, let me work on it. So. Uh, we'll continue to, uh, to work on that as well. Um, downstairs in our building, um, again, this is a huge exposure opportunity for us. Um, when I say exposure, having people into this facility that maybe were not aware um, that we were here, uh, it still amazes me. You know, it's been within the last three months that somebody told me they were checking out at Walmart and the young lady said that they were enrolled in criminal justice classes at the Sedalia campus. And they said, oh, well, that's great. You know, if you ever need help, stop by the Clinton campus. We'll be happy to help you. And she looked at them befuzzled. There's a campus in Clinton. Okay. Mm -hmm. Blue roof, lighted sign. Uh, it, it just amazes me. We're best kept secret. The foster closet in the teacher's warehouse, we do have work study, um, work study funds um, 
coming up for this next year that are tied to positions that help support this. They help with the intake of donations. The foster closet um, provides um, clothing. Um, it might even be strollers, car seats, anything for any foster placement um, that could be an emergency placement or maybe they've been in care, changing seasons. Um, it's just fantastic what they have set up down there. The teacher's warehouse also operates off of donations. It is available to teachers throughout our area to be able to come in and pick up any items that they need for their classroom. These pictures were, of course, taken on professional development day when we were doing our volunteering. Uh, but again, great resources to our community that we try to help support. And again, I feel like any, any opportunity to have someone grace our doors um, is an opportunity. Then I just had to quit putting pictures in and go, okay, what else do I want to talk about? <laughs> so we participated in uh, Clinton's Enrollment Fair and the Sherwood Enrollment Fair. Um, Golden Valley um, did a career fair and their Healthy Families Expo. So I feel like we're trying to be visible and be present, you know, at those um, school and community events. We hold positions with Bright Futures, the Henry County Chart Group, Henry County Health Centers Helping the Homeless, and Golden Valley's Patient Family and Advisory Committee as well. Vocational Rehabilitation is here with us on Tuesdays. We have an office space that Carrie Edwards comes in and lands in. That's been a great networking opportunity as well. Um, thanks to one of our fire inspections, uh, we um, opened up our testing center to be able to the local fire department here and they bring in folks for firefighter certification testing. We've had individuals come in for those certification testings that came, you know, from two hours away. They come from the lake area. They came, they come from the north. Um, so again, just a great opportunity for us. We partner with the Learning Force regularly for training, most recently Learn to Lead and Excel. Uh, we might loan them laptops that we have available to be able to take and do those, as well as provide the facility support um, to make those happen. We also offer space to our foster parent group. We've hosted a MoDOT planning session. We did the socket area internet kickoff. They were right out here in the lobby. Again, about another 30 individuals that I don't know that I'd ever seen here before. Um, but just um, coming in for that particular event. Coming up on May 30th, um, DESE, their Office of Early Childhood, they're gonna host a meeting here as well. So we look forward to seeing them. We did work on a dual credit schedule for fall, and that should be spring of 24, ignore my typo, uh, with Sherwood High School, that they are, um, it's kind of a ride the bus program. They're gonna do a drop off here before they drop off at Clinton Technical School. So their dual credit students will have an opportunity. They do not have school on Mondays. So we built a Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, kind of a non-traditional schedule for them. But we're excited to see how that goes for the fall. Um, and last but not least on this list, the counselor workshop that we're working on in collaboration with Health Sciences for June that will bring about 30 high school counselors here to the Clinton campus to highlight state fair and the Clinton campus uh, programs, health science programs. Questions on any of those? So graduation has come and gone, and I wanted to show you some faces um, just as the graduates. I shared some of these with, um, with Dr. Bates as well. Um, the picture there to the left is of um, our medical assisting group. Um, Emily and Ashlyn are pictured there. They're two of our, uh, we call them peer mentors, but our work studies here at the Clinton campus in the second picture. The third one over is our nursing, year two nursing group from this year. And then the two on the far right, the top one, um, that's Olivia. She came through multiple hospitalizations, um, never thought that day would come. And I hope you can see on her face um, the excitement that that day had finally come. Um, the bottom one there is my niece, Rochelle. She was kind of in the same boat. She just wasn't sure she would ever see that day. And just, I hope you see the genuineness in that accomplishment, all their faces. We also, um, I, again, my 20 year memory, if it serves me right, um, I believe that Clinton was one of the first schools to sign an early college agreement with State Fair way back in the day. Um, and I think that this was the first early college grad from Clinton High School. Her name is Harley. She graduated from State Fair on the 19th. She graduated from Clinton on the 21st. And oh, by the way, she technically had just finished her junior year. So she was a year ahead of schedule. Um, it was um, 
accidentally overlooked. We had representatives there. Michelle was there to hand off her certificate um, and they missed the announcement during graduation. So we had to give her a little extra social media love to highlight um, her accomplishment. But this young lady um, hit my radar a year ago, summer of last year. Um, she was good friends with a, a, another student we were working with and she came in and she's like, I went online, I printed the AA, I'm checking off classes. I was like, have you had anybody help you? Nope, just been doing it myself. They told me I could do this and I'm showing them I can do this. So she was like, do you want a job? <laughs> because that's fantastic that she was so resourceful. So my last uh, slide here, um, if you've been to the Clinton campus, there is um, uh, kind of a tattered piece of paper that is framed on the front desk. And the very top line says, without the student, there is no need for the institution. And I hope that if there is anything that, um, that I and this team and this campus can carry forward is um, absolutely that message. Um, I've shared a couple of things here. One was a thank you from one of our homeschool parents um, that um, she was complimenting how the staff made the enrollment process very seamless and very easy. You know, that sometimes homeschool students can meet with some challenges. Um, and they went from taking a class and it went so well to being full-time students with us now, both of her children. So um, that's an awesome, awesome kudos that we wanted to share. Um, the little snip that you see of the message actually came to Michelle Slater. One of our students yesterday reached back out to her. She got a call from the director of the dental hygiene program and she was accepted. So of course we love to celebrate those moments um, as well. You'll see Abby and Michelle pictured here again, two key parts of this team that I could not continue to do what we do here without them um, and their input. So my last little soft story that I wanna leave you with because I like to talk to my team a lot about um, ownership of the student. And, you know, we, it shouldn't matter what they need or at what point they come to us. It's about meeting them where they're at and being the one that goes, come on, I got you. You know, um, we had a dad that called me up. His son was a high, is a high school senior and he was going to take him out of school on a Wednesday. And it was a, he's like, this day, this is the day we've got. He said, I want to go to Sedalia and I want to do a tour. I'd like to do a tour with him. I would come to Clinton a little tour, talk to you all, kind of get a plan, kind of was trying to work out what son wanted to do, you know, okay, it was a day that was admissions was heading in 15 different directions with eight people, that's how it works, you know, and I'm like, rats, who's going to give the student a tour, that's calling a favor of Dr. Bates and go boss, I need, need to give a tour, um, I called up Dondi Ramirez, and anybody that knows Dondi, he was raised in the extended campus, started with us as an instructor, I was like, I need a favor, and I know you're probably busy, we're in enrollment, but I need a favor. He's like, I got you, what you need? And he stepped up, spent an hour with that student, met him in Hopkins, walked him around, showed him everything, answered their questions. They came back here and met with us that afternoon and just thrilled about what they saw and about the opportunities that they saw. So um, that's what it's all about, is making that connection, ownership of the student, whatever we need to do to move them forward. So. Thank you all. Thank you for your continued support um, of State Fair, of our extended campus locations. I can't say that enough, but I hope this gave you a little bit of insight to the Clinton campus. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Darren. All right. Thank you. If you come to the employee recognition ceremony, Daryl will be receiving their 20 year pin. Oh, awesome. Look forward to seeing you. Be there, so. All right. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, looks like we're ready for item number eight the athletic complex design piece. Hey. So it is uh, recommended for the trustees to accept the, uh, the quote from BSR Design of One Park, Kansas. It is an amount to not to exceed 80,000 plus a 10% contingency for the design construction, for design construction documents, construction administration of an athletic complex consisting of a track, soccer, baseball, softball fields, 
controls itself for the competition area of these facilities, otherwise known as what it gets us. Ancillary facilities such as ticket booths, restrooms, concessions, data, et cetera, are not in the scope of BSR and nine services. So it's necessary and it's necessary to utilize any part of the contingency. Um, we'll have to vote uh, myself and the president unless uh, approved of its use. I also further recommend the president and the vice president of the planning administration be authorized to direct to sign the agreement with BSR design for those access to necessary material in terms of the agreement. Funding source will be um, uh, through the SFCC Foundation. All right, I would entertain a motion to accept that. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? So I suppose you've been doing this for quite some time, I guess, as far as the athletic complex and Darren Paneer heavily involved in this. Yes, and this uh, architect comes uh, at the recommendation of our contact at Septagon. They've worked with this uh, particular architect. He's uh, designed Olympic facilities. Uh, his specialty area is athletic facilities. That's what he does. And so uh, we work with him and how they work with us. So he's, he's met with us, and we've done some preliminary planning and um, Work for our fundraising efforts to, to set that in place, mm -hmm. and we've had good experience with that. We're now ready to, to work on the next phase. Any other questions? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, so same sign. And I do want to call and say hi and thank you, Amy. I know you were mentioned in the in the last in the institutional report, and Amy's with us today. And, and I apologize, I meant to say that as soon as the dare was done and forgot. So thank you for joining us today. I, I, I think, think it might be important to note that the, we're using the city of Sedalia facilities for baseball, football. Now, the indoor, the indoor facilities we have going to the synthetic will allow teams to to uh, practice at times when due to weather uh, would otherwise be unable to do so and that the uh, and that just the soccer and track facility is a combined facility that uh, both programs be designed where both programs can uh, can use that facility is is the way it's being presented and proposed. And yeah, in addition, the track team uses facilities all over. We we use facilities at the high school. We have some little places on campus where they you know practice some of the throwing events and things like that. So this would consolidate our track. Track and field into one place as well. As I, I go along with what Richard said. When I was attending school here in the late eighties, mid to late eighties, basketball we didn't have the ball. We went to the state fairgrounds. They had a wooden floor they put down on the floor of the ag building. That's where we played our home games. So where we graduated from, and the level of professionalism that. The structure displays for our sports team kind of blends, in my opinion, with the level of professionalism for the other structures that have been created on the state fair campus. So I think that holds as a huge uh, monument to what work's been done and is going to be done, and also bring our students and other, and not just students, faculty as well. We currently have about 300 student athletes. Okay. All right. Uh, so now the sonography lab remodel. So we continue to do some remodeling to our facilities here. It's recommended the board of trustees accept the low bid in the amount of thirty-eight thousand five hundred from very good construction. We also know from the remodel of building two forty-three for the office for not necessarily the sonography faculty and staff, but for other faculty and staff um, and the health sciences. So that's a little. Is that a thing on my part? But for other health sciences, faculty, staff. Two other bids were received. 
recommended that the Vice President of the Financing Administration be authorized to direct the signing agreement with Very Good Construction and for those acts as necessary to carry out the terms of the agreement. Funding for this will be college capital reserves. So we've been started on a plan on office space that we've been um, implementing over the last year. And uh, we have some health science faculty that are sharing offices. So that's not a real conducive uh, situation for, for faculty members, especially when they're meeting, conferencing with uh, students and things like that. So this is part of that plan, moving our sonography lab, uh, lab, lab into a larger area and then converting that former lab space into a classroom or uh, office space. So just a little bit more information on that. Appreciate that. All right, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We need more discussion. I was wondering, <clears throat> was it simply the low bid as to why we went with this construction? I, I found it interesting and uh, did minor research. The uh, company that's been recommended has been in business, I believe, is a year and a half uh, versus the other one on the granted on the high end of the uh, the quote, been around for 27 years. So what was the determining factor as to why we're going to go Actually, well, we're direct to take what's to the low bill as we can have some um, Valid, valid reason not to that we feel they would not be able to perform the company the, the construction and we have nothing to believe that they are not able to do the job at this point in time they were a little bit and um so you know, i know um, ben burson who is our project manager he was you know, very um, supportive of, of choosing them so in the absence of any you know, reason Yes, you're right. We went with a little bit. Yeah, I worked with Ben. Yeah, right. I worked I work with Ben on this. And so he actually knows the work. So these folks aren't just like one and a half years in the business. They actually have been in the construction, but they started their own business. And, and so it's only been around formally a year and a half, but the folks as it have been part of other businesses or whatever, and they've, they've been successful. Yeah, right? And he's well aware of them. So we felt. Okay. Like, and I did know notice they had a. a, a, a <laughs> Physical address in Columbia as well as Nelson. Uh, I, was, I was just curious why that was. If there was something, and it sounds like there was something else. Is the uh, personal and, recommendation. And additionally, the the work itself, the scope is fairly low um, risk in comparison to if we were looking at something much bigger, it might have been yeah. taken another. Well, I was just but simply yes. curious. I mean, it would be wouldn't make cause me to direct more other than direct questions. I appreciate that, guys. Yeah, and we had we we had this company redo the stage for the theater mm -hmm. over Christmas break. That's true. Great job, no complaints. So that was another. And I guess I'll just I mean nothing with the company's just verifying bids are equal here. I noticed that on their bid, the one we're going with, they stated that we will provide certain material. It'll be installed by us, and some of it some of it's being installed by them. Looking at the other bids, it Here's that, is that the same, like the carpeting? I mean, it's, it's all equal, right? Like, I guess they're all bidding the same, bidding the same technical score. scope. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it really yeah. came down to their percentage of what they were gonna make off the job. At the very end, you could really, it was very, it was one of them was, forgive me, I think 18%, one was 15% and the, the more of the new company was much lower, which drove the cost for them down. So they're taking a smaller profit. That's really. Yeah, the other two is just make it appear like they may be doing them. I just want to make sure I was reading it right. That's all I was really after. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All right, heavy duty rotary cutter brush hog. This should be a little deja vu for some of you here. <laughs> Um, we um, we went we had this um, <clears throat> brought to the board a couple months ago. We're bringing it back to you um, due to a delay. So the original bid that we were awarded the bid to when um, Brad went to Bristol, our director of agriculture went to purchase it, was informed that it was not 
available, in fact, were not be available until October of 2023. Um, so they were unable to fulfill fulfill the contract, essentially. Wasn't it used? No, oh, it was a new. That was a new one. It was a brand new one for, for John Deere out here. So they were unable to provide it. Um, and it was a very basic brush hog, but it was enough what we needed. The other one that was bid um, was from Ag Power. Ag Power one is more expensive model. It's also a much more um, capable model, I guess is a good way of saying it. And it is, it is on the lot, it is available for immediate, um, for immediate delivery. From Crown. From Crown Power. I'm sorry, yeah, from Crown. Yeah, from Crown. Yeah. My name's from Crown. So uh, we'll come to you today with on the on the request of um, Brad Driscoll is that um, that you we reject the bid from um, Ag Power for the uh, John Deere rotary cutter and then recommend that you accept the bid in its place for a bush hog 2850 rotary cutter in the amount of 32,000 from Crown Power and equipment in Lamont Mo. And then funding is the same source, the additional FY23 operating budget, that will pretty much be on the um, balance of that, of that additional funding. I would entertain a motion to accept. A question, Terry. Okay. Do, I am assuming it's it's okay to do this in one one motion, although we're doing two different separate actions. Oh. We're, we're basically, is that flow fine? That okay to do that? Then yeah, you're right. We're rejecting one and accepting another. The same. The same. Two catch there too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So I'd entertain a motion. Um, yeah, we're rejecting one and accepting the one from Crown Power. Okay. Any second? Second. Any other? Just the, just the timing. The timing is a critical issue here. Right. And we, met, we missed the scene. Mm -hmm. So what's the price difference on the two? Sixteen thousand dollars. Sixteen grand is the price difference. You just said we missed the opening to the season. We would miss. We, we would miss. Oh, okay. use the season. Plus, one, from what I was researching, this uh, this uh, bush hog is. Much heavier duty. Oh, it's, it's, it's top of the line. Yes, it's, it's it has all the recommended safety elements, and it's just heavy duty. So. Yeah, we rolled out a pre-owned piece of equipment entirely. I don't know that anything's been been. And sometimes it costs as much. To be honest, we, we no, 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 no one did a pre-owned piece when we put the bid out there, and the bid itself didn't. Didn't specify pre owned or new, which is in the If I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, we, we talked about that and the fact that the warranty work and things like that might not have been specifically about the rotary cutter, but it was about some equipment that were getting for the farm. Now, getting it, of course, local and also the uh, manufacturer's warranty and the, 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 the repairs and whatnot, if so needed, would be oversight. Is that right? I think when I spoke briefly with Brad, you know, bush hogs are, they go through a lot of wear and tear if they're, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say, yeah, I would say then, you know, no one would be able to use one, um, we didn't need nice one to use one, um, Brad at this point is requesting that we approve it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just like anything else. You know, you buy you buy a used full drive pickup truck on how it's been used. And like you just said, Keith, some people tear the tear the Jesus out of their bush bush hogs and or whatever rotary cutter they're in. Right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Close same sign. Storage area network refresh. I'm going to attempt to let 
just the paper you described what we're doing here. I spent about an hour with him trying to figure out how to understand. But he's going to explain to you what we're getting, why we're going with a bid that on the surface may look like it's a little more expensive than some of the other ones. To your point about, you know, talking about are we going to the lower bid. In this case, we think we are on a long term prospect. Short term is a little more, but long term is probably going to save us a lot of money for this particular vendor. Uh, and give his um, explanation in five minutes of that. So you can have five minutes. Or well, I said my little hours. He to English. Here we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey, do you guys know what a storage area network is? Can you need me explain that? Basically, in fact, false. I will hear like that. <laughs> there you go. That close to that. Exactly. Yeah, pretty close. It's like a gazillion of the hard drive. Sure yeah. laptop. There's only three things I know. I know this. Um, so what this storage area network does for us in the Central Data Center, it is a repository of all of our online and digital um, files and documents. Okay, it's all, pretty important. It's pretty important. It's core to everything that we do. It's super important that it's highly available. And that it's fast because we get thousands upon thousands upon thousands of requests on it at any given time. Because we have people putting data in, we have people taking data out, putting files in, taking files out uh, from a, a lot of different ways and, and directions. So it's super important to this institution. It's one of two units. The second unit will be up for refresh next year. And the reason why we're here at right now speaking about this is because the company that we currently have, the manufacturer, is end of life, end of support. We're done, I mean, it is done. Um, so this particular unit, the reason why we picked it is because when we move from a unit like this, we actually have to do a migration. And that migration will cause an outage, okay? The architecture on this one, for future purposes does two things for us. Yes, it, first off, it gets us in the door year one at the rate at the pricing that we wanted, but it has subsequent maintenance per year. What this architecture does, it includes a, um, um, again, I'm translating here on the fly. Uh, it, it includes equipment embedded in the, in the unit that allows us to be upgraded in a modular way. We never will have an outage for the life of this unit. The other part of that is because it includes that new refresh automatically in that annual maintenance, it's refreshed more often in the five years that we get right now. So the life expectancy on this unit actually has uh, some industry uh, 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 history to it of 10 plus years. So that's why we think we're getting a better value for the equipment, the equipment doing this way. It is state of the art, it's super fast, super efficient, and we get some benefit out of it in the long term. So the other ones will have to refresh another five, five years. years. We have to wait for the five five years. Another five years, which yeah. is hopefully 10 years. So, yeah. Mark has a way. Making spending money makes sense, you know. <laughs> it doesn't knack for that. But anyway, <laughs> to, this, to this point, this is probably what it is. I mean, literally, is the backbone of all our data. Everything we do. So, with that in mind, recommend the board of trustees accept a bid from Pure Storage of Mountain View, California, in the amount of eighty-seven seven nine five in year one, plus sixteen eight hundred annually thereafter um, in maintenance costs for its flash array. Including insulation, including insulation support for SFCC storage area network refresh. The pure storage solution is the most cost effective solution over time, and funding is through the FY24, FY24 operating budget and subsequent operating budgets. So, the, this project has gone through budget review for the next fiscal year yes. and had a priority high enough that it needed to be included, included in the budget. Budget, which we will formally approve. Yeah. 
in the next month and said the very top of Mr. Haverly's list of admissions of, of ads to FY24 budget. And I'll entertain a motion to accept. So moved. And a second. Second. Any more questions or discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see 1524. Uh, Darcy McPhail is going to cannot be here tonight, so playing a part of Darcy McPhail will be Brent Case. <laughs> um, so, um, policy 1524, if you look at tab 12, describes our uh, administrative organization, our distributed leadership, and um. <clears throat> There was one part of that uh, organization that in practice hasn't been utilized at the institution for several years. Dr. Anderson eliminated the quality improvement um, <coughs> at the time that equip that accreditation process was eliminated. So by practice, we haven't been doing what this policy says. And it's important for us to make this change now because this is a key policy cited in our accreditation evidence that we're getting ready to submit to HLC. So um, we're proposing that we eliminate the quality improvement system reference in this policy because it, by practice we haven't been doing it. So moved. Is that something we should implement rather than take it out? No, there are other, we're working on other ways to accomplish some of the same thing. Second. Oh, Tom, that's good. Good question. Good question. Yeah, any other questions or discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Right. Policy 6410, placement testing. That's important. So what we have um, presented for you this evening is a change to the policy language in 6410. Um, previously, the policy um, talked specifically about assessment and mandatory placement for students. Um, it also referenced um, placement testing, ensuring that students be placed in a course sequence at the level where they're most likely to succeed. Scratched some of that language and focused more on language um, centered around scores rather than individual tests. The reason for that is we need to be able to add our guide and self-placement tool that we created during the um, COVID-19 pandemic as an option for all students. So if you'll recall, I don't remember how many of you were on the board, we'll tell a little story about COVID-19, right? And period of time, and, uh, congregate testing was not an option, right? For several months, there were no ACTs, there were no SATs, there were no active placers. We simply couldn't come back together and come back on campus. Um, so in not only did state fair, but many colleges and universities had to scramble to find a way to either move forward without placement testing or find an alternative way to do that. So in the period of time before we were able to do um, Zoom proctoring and have all of the allowances and the approvals to do that for all of the different testing agencies we work with, we needed something to be able to continue to move forward. Because at the time, um, placement testing was a huge part of our admissions process. You could not become a student without a placement test. Um, Amy um, Schrader, the division chairs, a number of faculty, um, huge uh, committee of people wrestled with how do we want to do that as an institution. So they developed a tool um, that essentially is a survey that allows students to go in and take a look at um, English um, examples, examples of questions and math problems, and then ask their confidence level in being able to solve something that looked like that. Right, so the entire tool is ba uh, based on a student's self-efficacy in those two areas. Um, once they get through the tool, it generates a score, right? And we use that score to place them right now into courses or to recommend that they be placed into courses um, in the math and English sequence. Those gateway courses are also the ones that we offer that are less than 100 level, right? So if you, if you walked out of the ACT with 12, right? There is a math course here for you, but it's not college algebra, right? Um, there is a sequence of courses to try to get people prepared. What we need to be able to do is change the policy language that reflects the fact that it's not a test, but it is still a score that we're going to use to move them forward. 
what kind of questions can I answer for you in that regard? Yes, sir. So the, the placement is not a requirement of enroll of admission. Not even. We fixed that policy so, a few months ago. So okay. so the placement is and if you require the testing before admission that can delay enrollment and particularly for non-traditional mm -hmm. students. Well, even traditional students in some of our very rural school districts, when you have to drive two and a half hours to take an ACT, you're kind of stuck unless yeah. you can do your active place with us by Zoom and hope your Wi-Fi is mm -hmm. right? So this helps facilitate admission with placement, placement not conditioned on on having a particular test done. Right. We um, we moved the requirement for testing away from admission, but right now they still cannot get a navigator appointment and they can't enroll with classes without a score of some sort. So it's still blocking enrollment. It does not block admission. So this will eliminate one of the barriers mm -hmm. to to getting an student enrolled and ready for classes. It might not eliminate the barrier, but it's sure going to lower the fence. Okay. Great. That helped. Thank you for the no, clarification. <laughs> and, and it's also continues our philosophy to, towards student success, Amen. student support versus you must go here and mm -hmm. must do X, Y, Z. It's, it's us allowing to counsel, advise, but yet the student will have the ultimate decision making. They are still the consumer. And we this is a tool to allow them to make the smart choices with us advising them. So it's not a placement like you must take this as we used to have. So it's also a mentality and change towards how, what services we can provide them to be successful and guide them from day one to and like Dr. Murgerson said, we removed the mandatory language. What you don't have in front of you for policy, right, because this is board level, um, in our regulation and our procedures that we're changing on campus, they're not going to be bound to that number. That allows them either an ACT score, an ActiPlacer score, or this guided self-placement score allows them to have a conversation either with faculty or with their navigator, and then they can choose. Well, you'll see, because um, other institutions have experienced this kind of change, you might find um, non-traditional students score into um, free calculus, but they are terrified of taking math because it's been 15 years. They can choose to place themselves down. You may have someone from an under-resourced high school that technically the last time they took an ACT their junior year because they couldn't afford it, can now choose to place themselves up if they feel like they have the confidence to work it out. So you don't get that language, you get this language. <laughs> And you also, and am I correct in remembering that we also added and approved the addition of tutoring? Yes. Of yes. additional tutoring yes. one of the positions, mm -hmm. and that the rationale for adding those were to mm -hmm. help with this, yes, right. this way of uh, placement testing. That paradigm shift that Dr. Murders was talking about, this is a fundamental shift in some of the um, access to those gateway courses and then overall operations. What services do we only have access to? We made that a priority. You all made that a priority as well. So how does it turn out so far? We haven't since we came back on campus. Mm -hmm. um, so for the last two years, the only time guided self-placement has been offered as an option for students is that they didn't have um, high-speed broadband at home to right. be able to do it's um, very limited. Yes, how, very limited. How has that turned out? Amy, do you have, I mean, it's, we're talking maybe 20 to 30 yeah, students. We haven't had many students use it to actually enroll and then complete a class. Because so we just haven't had it in place long enough. Yeah, we haven't had it in place. Yeah, we haven't had it in place. We have a true strategy. Yeah. Success. yeah. We are relying a lot on data from um, the pandemic and that limited time that we've used it for enrollment purposes. And we just changed that policy a few months ago. But we also have sister institutions in the state of Missouri that we're pulling from their experience as well, because they have done this a few years ahead of us. Seems like to me that it holds that function very well. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. But to me, it also appears.
years as though it's shifting your mindset from your traditional, I graduated high school, now I'm going to move into college. They're starting to make decisions as opposed to being led around. So I, I think that actually is a huge uh, benefit. So. The old in loco parentis, right? So we are clearly acting as your parents because we know better than you. That's, yeah. That is a long since gone philosophy. Maybe it's college or high school. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's very good right. for that purpose. Okay. That first purpose you know, that you're actually experiencing real life decisions that you're going to be expected to be making. And there are things that a placement test cannot measure. They don't know what your support system at home looks like. They don't know how many other people are pulling on your Wi-Fi. They don't know how long it's been from college. It is a blind number. This allows students to make a decision on their own. Well, how will policy change? How will that work with, with our free community? Does it make any difference? Does it does it facilitate? Actually, it's how we support those students they were going to give us. Mm -hmm. I should say, yeah, but they're not accepting because they are following placement requirements and they don't meet their requirements. So they're to them, they're underprepared. Mm -hmm. So we will get those same underprepared, but we will allow them all the same policy to see where they best fit. Yeah. So it will actually facilitate mm -hmm. that that will be a, a great place to see results okay. and i see this as a transitioning thing too you may see this again a, a year from now as we continue to move towards less and less placement testing at all so we're, we're, we're working we'll be using this data to help confirm future but we can't just jump there so so do you want to read what uh, the motion is or do you do you have that in front of you? Or? I have the policy itself. I don't have the okay. motion. All right. So um, it's recommended the board of trustees approve a revision to policy 6410. And these changes uh, have been through institutional review, recommendations, feedback, and consensus cycle process as defined in the internal communication plan and as required by policy 1510. Policy language really is, is tab 13 in our yes. board materials. Policy 0510. Um, what did I say? You added an extra one in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. You're placing the whole map. And I'll <laughs> so, Yes, and, all right. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, all in favor say aye. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I, it is kind of anticlimactic because that brief presentation represented hours and hours and hours of work and continuous hours. And, and, hours. Right and lots of IT support. I don't want to leave yes. market people out. Lots and, of and, you, and future IT support. <laughs> I would like to recognize Amy and uh, Kaylee Hobbs and Tim Miller for their work in that, along with the leadership of Dr. Murs and Dr. Porter. Okay. Most of this is in his area. So oh. He's carrying the water. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, Dr. Bates. That well, uh, as policy, we conducted the Board of Trustees evaluation, the 360 evaluation, and we uh, received, uh, I, I would say, uh, very strong response from um, our stakeholders. And uh, so today, um, we I have visited with uh, the board president and vice president about kind of steps forward. And I think the discussion that came out of that, uh, Mr. Parker has uh, agreed to lead a small team to analyze these results and bring back some uh, analysis to the board at its June meeting. So um, I think we were going to discuss it at a June retreat. June retreat. Right. Yep. The summer retreat. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, looking for volunteers. Yeah. So we do appreciate though those who, who were able to take that and, and give us some feedback because I think we want to be an effective board. And so that data will help us to set some goals for us. And so we look forward to that retreat where we can have conversation. So it is included in your packet. 
um, if you have it in print, you know, what it was um, and the different uh, words that were used. So we'll use that. And if you want to help Richard uh, take that data and kind of condense it into, you know, a smaller uh, plan. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in our summer retreat. So let Richard or myself know if you'd like to help. Anything else on that? In the July. Yeah, in July. July. I can't remember. You need volunteers? I'll help him. Oh, okay. awesome. Okay. July 29th. Just retreat. Just We'll get to the set of time after we had a chance to individually review and thank you and get together and do things. And well, I pull out my old statistical, my old statistics notes to review the standard deviations. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to attend this meeting. <laughs> I play golf on our, on our day before. Every time. I also would so encourage you to, you know, <laughs> to, to take a look at I today before I came, I looked at ACCT on, you know, board, you know, what a, what our board responsibilities are, um, you know, and helping that with the data that we'll get from them to set those goals. So be sure you take time. And then we also have that book that Dr. Bates uh, ordered for each of us to have. And, and so it's recommended there um, that we read that book and have some things about uh, setting goals. Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Bates, President Report. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the legislative session is over and uh, the budget was approved as required by the Constitution and uh, the recommendation to the budget uh, has been for the community college budget has been in line with our budget planning. So uh, the 7% uh, to the community college core, to the RMO Excels funding, uh, which includes nearly $5 million for our cap building, equipment for our cap building and our capital improvement project which is another $2.5 million for our CAP project. Those are all in the budget and uh, just waiting the, the governor's uh, signature. So that's that's all positive. Um, one of the, you know, I thank each of you for uh, attending. Amy, we know you were at a family uh, commitment out of state and we missed you, but it was, uh, Last week was a wonderful week of celebration, uh, student success with our um, our graduation ceremonies. And um, so I want to recognize uh, our team that puts together uh, the graduation ceremony. And that includes uh, Dr. Murders, who is the uh, chair of that team, Shelly Gardner, Katie Palmer, Holly Graves, James Trujillo, Christine Brown, Debbie Hammonds, Brad Peterson, Kim Comer, um, Chris Kindle, the um, music instructor, Joe Schreierman, Schreiman, the uh, band instructor, Julian Neal, Christina Kemp, uh, Katie Stanley Dietzman, Mary Choyner, Joe Lynn Turley, Tara Weber, Shelley Williams, um, Beverly Marquez, Deanna Blackledge, Lisa Osterley. So I wanted to say all of those names because I didn't want to leave anybody out. But I especially wanted to recognize, and I didn't ask them all to come today uh, because some of you, that is punishment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I didn't want to punish them for their good work, but I did want to call out especially Dr. Murders and um, Shelley Gardner and uh, Katie Palmer and Paul Graves for their work. It was an incredible graduation. Uh, commencement ceremony and uh, the special touches they brought um, made the ceremony even more special. So I appreciate their work, Dr. Murders, especially. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I did provide you some statistics, and at that George at their uh, desk, we had uh, 76 grads walking at the health science ceremony and 218 at the main ceremony. Uh, last year, we had around 175 at that ceremony. So it's, it's um, you know, a little increase. In terms of the 2022, 2023, the 2023 academic year, 
we awarded 615 degrees and certificates. Last year, we awarded 636 degrees and certificates, so it's about the same level uh, as the previous years. But I thought the breakdown of degrees and certificates was interesting. 319 Associate of Arts degrees, 153 Associate of Applied Science degrees. Those are our technical degrees and health science degrees. 24 Associate Arts and Teaching degrees. Seven Associate of Fine Arts degrees. That's a new, really new degree program for us. Eight Associate of Science degrees. Those are students transferring in the sciences, typically engineering. Uh, 76 professional certificates and 28 skills certificates. We have 130 pending graduates, uh, pending completion of classwork in the summer, 23 jobs. So this completion is important. It's um, not all students are here with the goal of completing the degree or certificate, but uh, this is significant uh, step in their career, meaning step to a job, step to transfer. So. Uh, it takes a huge team to get this done. I appreciate their work. Uh, did you all have any comments on the graduation or input? I, I will say the AEL staff was particularly <clears throat> impressed with the level of board involvement at that graduation. Thank you so much uh, for being there. They really appreciate that. And I know the students were uh, impressed too with that entire board. Any other comments on it? Or I haven't learned much about it. It's a someone like you. I know. I, I know. I haven't been to a plethora of, of graduations here in my short time on the board, but I will say I I think I know the major retired in the Air Force. It might have something to do with this, but um, the level of organiz organization, knowing what we're supposed to, I I refer to it at least as, as my homework. So I brought my homework with me. I mean, it's like that was amazing. I love that because you knew what was going on. So I, although you might blow it off and say, "Oh, somebody else," you might even say, "The guy sitting to your left did it." We know that's not true. <laughs> he just he did it. <laughs> he paid for it though. <laughs> that's that's okay. He's going to. That's <laughs> okay. But the level of the level of professionalism that you brought to that particular ceremony or series of ceremonies, I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Well said. All right. And um, if you look at the calendar at the back of the agenda, I wanted to call your attention to a couple of things. First, not on your calendar, but at your table. Saturday, June 3rd is the Denton County Art Fair. And State Fair Community College is a key sponsor of that. Uh, arts, fine and performing arts are, are important to us. And it's a way to extend out that support to the Benton County community. The employee recognition banquet is June 8th. And uh, there will be an uh, recognizing employees in, in a number of different areas of service uh, to the community. We're also recognizing the board emeritus that were named this year. So I know Mr. Eaton is uh, planning to attend. Um, then on June 9th, uh, Representative Alford is on campus. He's uh, hosting his Agriculture Advisory Committee meeting. It's his own meeting his group that advises him on agriculture issues. He's hosting that meeting on our campus. And uh, so we're honored to uh, have them on campus, uh, the representative and his agriculture advisory committee. And that will be his first visit to our campus. It'll be his first visit. And so uh, we are planning a tour. Uh, his schedule is somewhat limited. It'll be probably an hour long tour. But uh, if if somebody would like to join that tour, uh, we'll send out information when that time has been uh, firmed up with the, with the representative's office. Um, we do have a group joining the United Way Day of Action, June 17th, led by Andrew, Angie Gentry, math instructor. And so we appreciate her work in leading that team. Um, the year-end employee uh, picnic is June 28th as well. 
And then on June 30th is the health science team. There's also information about that at your table. And that's at 2 p.m. in Stopiker Theater. And uh, if you would arrive by 1.30, there, there are, um, I'm not for sure, Allison, but I believe the group will gather probably in Stopiker 60 to, to uh, address for that. But I'm not for sure if that's exact. One of the classrooms there. Um, June 20th to June 22nd is the uh, Missouri Community College Trustee and Executive Leadership Conference. Uh, President um, Wood and Richard Parker uh, is uh, attending that. Um, I'm probably not going to be there. Uh, I'm expecting to be at my folks, uh, my family's wheat harvest. But Dr. Murders will be there. Keith will be there. I believe Dr. Porter will be there. And uh, on Wednesday evening, uh, the agenda is free. Uh, Keith will be hosting um, dinner for everyone. One officer. He's going to be the <laughs> one officer taking folks out for dinner. He's pretty good. He's good at it. Good at it. <laughs> yeah. Last one was some success. I think he said sushi. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. And finally, uh, this week, uh, I attended uh, two, two meetings uh, in Jefferson City. One, uh, I'm on the uh, Commissioner of Higher Education's uh, Advisory Committee. And so I uh, met with the new commissioner, uh, Dr. Box. I placed at your table uh, a, um, a short bio about Dr. Box. So, but it was good to meet with him. And um, so he shared uh, with us his goals for the upcoming year as the commissioner. He's gonna continue to press on with the uh, department's strategic plan and initiatives. That's significant for us because one of the goals of that strategic plan, the key goal of that is to increase credential attainment from adults in Missouri to 60 percent and uh, so that's a, a stretch goal we're well below that in our region uh, but uh, I, I think uh, that's an opportunity for us to build that into our enrollment management planning um, and and there's other reasons for us to do that as well but so he's continuing that um, he's working on organizational integration of dude um, integrating the workforce development staff which used to be a different unit in the state government with the higher education department. So there is additional synergy that can occur. He's uh, preparing for the 2024 legislative session. He's conducting listening tours and indeed he'll probably be in our area to meet with our board, see our campus uh, and learn more about State Fair Community College. Uh, and uh, he's uh, highly involved in that new funding formula which they're working on. Uh, his first question to me was, why is your college name State Fair? <laughs> so I was... After I, in the weather, I, gave him, the I, gave the good, uh, <laughs> I also serve on an advisory committee for that new performance funding model. It's a, it's a law that the department uh, put together a new performance funding plan for higher education. And there's a deadline for it. I believe it's um, August 1st or maybe soon. So there's been a process for that uh, going on. The the group that's working on that, there's a, a, um, a contractor who's been hired to work with the, the department on that. They're, they've gone into it with the philosophy that uh, we probably don't just need performance funding. We need a whole funding model because uh, really that funding model is 30 years old at least in higher education. So it's an opportunity to really look at how higher education is, is funding. Um, I should note that uh, during the legislative session, there was some money set aside for performance funding, but it was limited to universities. And the state one was made, community colleges already have their own kind of performance funding model for distribution of their fund. Um, and uh, so the state was made that Colleges didn't really need a, a performance funding, already had it. 
But uh, I think it's important to note that the department is continuing to pursue a new funding model for community colleges as well as universities. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that turns out, but um, we're not off the hook or uh, we're not headed that way. I mean, we are, you know, could be or could not be. Uh, so that they rolled out this week, the mathematical model for this and provide some um, so explanation of what they're envisioning. And uh, so I haven't received the detailed slides. I did take detailed notes. I'll be sharing it with the leadership team on Tuesday because I think we need to be aware of it as we plan for the future because we want to poise our institution. We want to position us best to um, best for this model. And so there's some things that we can do. And so the model is based on this concept. There's a frugal, they call a frugal base. And that's, that's for a, a community college or university, what's the kind of required minimum amount, a frugal amount uh, that it takes to operate that institution? That's kind of what we should be working towards as a, as a, a state first. We want to make sure our institutions are appropriately funded, not not overfunded or not the Cadillac funding, at least the frugal base. We don't know if we are, you know, going into this, don't know if we are or not. And then if you can get that level of funding, then you can start talking about performance funding on top of that. And uh, so as the model worked out, uh, the frugal base, which is basically, in kind of simplifying our terms, 60% of kind of standard funding for community colleges across the nation. Okay. And as they looked at this model right now, it looks like there would be need to be a significant investment to bring community colleges and universities up to that approval base. And in fact, uh, the, the numbers suggested that community colleges are significantly underfunded compared to uh, our brethren across the, the country, even leading up to this kind of approval base. Um, so um, maybe uh, in, in comparison to the universities and a percentage of the universities, it's, you know, it's very obvious that the community colleges are, are more out of whack than, than the universities, but both are. It would take some uh, funding to, to bring it up to that. So uh, then um, the goal in this process would for state and local revenues for community colleges, for state and local revenues to account for 60% of the frugal base and students would account for 40% of that. And uh, so they tentatively ran the numbers. Uh, they gave us a glimpse of it on a screen. I kind of, I took a picture of State Fair Community College real quick and did some math on it. And um, if this model was adopted and uh, funded, if we were brought up to that frugal pace, it would be very good for state fair college. It would significantly increase our state funding, uh, you know, more than double. We would need more than double our state funding. Uh, we get about $9 million currently um, to bring us up to that. Point. So, you know, the bottom line is we're significantly underfunded compared to other community colleges in other parts of the country from the state, and uh, what's the result? Our students have taken the brunt of that. Our students have had to pick up um, the brunt of that funding to, to make up for that. So um, more to come, but, uh, and I don't wanna bore you with the details at this point in time, but we're gonna start talking about this and building this into these ideas into our enrollment management planning and our budget planning so that as these 
because it takes time to move the train. And, and uh, so if, if we try to react after, it's too late. So we need to start moving some things now. Key part of that is around those that 60% goal, that 60% goal attainment, especially for adults, especially for underrepresented minorities, um, and for underprepared students, all things right in our wheelhouse at State of the So anyway, I it's important stuff. It's not exciting stuff necessarily. Dr. Murders likes that thing, kind of key likes that kind of thing, but uh, learning those models, but I want to make sure that it's here. So that's my report. Any questions about that? I'll just comment that the hiring of the this particular commission was clearly done with the performance model funding in mind. So it's not a, it's more than just an idea. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's, at least in my mind, it's relatively certain that we'll be going to a, a performance performance uh, funding model uh, to have forethought to be prepared for it is going to be important. Okay. All right. Financial report. Taking approval is not a financial report. <laughs> and by definition, by definition, we are approval because we live within the means that we are given. Um, the report for April is attached. Uh, I will say that as I look at the, um, you know, our main source of funding, which is Twitch and the P, we were probably in the year about one to two percent below budget on that. Um, which one and two percent is what between 100 to 300 pounds for short. So that's, I'm not necessarily <laughs> here. We had a slight, um, our enrollment's a little bit lower than last year, but it's really the mix of the enrollment that you're seeing a little bit different there. So just make you aware of that. Um, but we make up for it in a lot of other places. Um, the state with the Missouri One Star Funds and other funds um, has been particularly supportive of colleges and some of their the grants they give them the, the industry training through one sort that's what's driving that. Uh some appropriations um strong to hear local property tax collections are stronger than I was expecting. So that's helping us out as well, as well as the um the byproduct of a otherwise not particularly great inflation picture, which is that was accelerating from investments. So overall, we will, we will, I'm pretty certain we'll end up higher overall our general fund revenues in the year is done, but we will be a little bit below the budget in terms of the actual tuition. Um, there that. Uh, from an expenditure standpoint, um, you see that we're obviously well ahead of our budget on um, operation maintenance plan. That's a lot of that is due to the construction we're doing, the way we we are accounting for things right now. There are a number of capital expenditure there that when the year ends, we'll do, we'll go in and, and reclassify some things into capital expenses that we're doing. But we bought a lot of equipment this year. We, we built a lot of we built a lot of stuff. We have used some capital reserves this year. Um, we approved an extra 150 for the farm this year. Um, so there's some things in there that we're doing to get us ready for the future. It's the reason we have you know, some of the funds to run it. So we are doing some things to really make that. So you'll see that. Um, go, go, you know, obviously be ahead. I still think overall the increase in our revenues with our general fund revenues will be greater than the increase in our general fund expenses when it's said and done. Although the last month, as always, everybody's trying to figure out, you know, what five dollars they have left to, to get spent that, that month. <laughs> but uh, overall, I'd say, and then the bottom line here will be very good also, and we'll have made a lot of progress in getting some things done on campus that we've been wanting to do for a few years. Um, you know, testing for you, know, for you. Um, HR's got new space 
um, you know, the buildings being built out, the dining hall is a big part of that being built out as well. And those are all things that will have a dramatic impact on our students when they get there. So, last thing, um, any questions? Last thing on the agenda is always like so I want to make sure I continue to report to you any purchases between 10 and 10, 5,000 that obviously didn't include, but we did during the month of April. We had one. Um, we had a $19,000 purchase from George AV for the, the music room. So last year, the music department sold, they had a music room that they sold and got 10,000 in. They sold it to Central Missouri. They got 10,000 in. So they took that plus 9,000 operating funds and they bought some new. Music room panels, diffusers, and had those installed. So that was, you know, it took a while, but they finally got it purchased in the end and installed. So I think they're happy. So that was one purchase that they could report in the information. Thank you. All right, for discussion. I just want to say again, yeah, I thought graduation was, um, you know, celebratory, I think was the word that maybe, you know, there was a lot of excitement. You missed the thing did streamers, you know, at the end, usually we don't. So uh, would you call them streamers? Is that what they were called? Sure. Okay. The, you know, <laughs> channel. Yeah, so I mean, these things for, for living. I mean, this, this thing, they're blue and silver. Came out, of, came out of nowhere. Yeah. Streamer. That's cool. Yeah, came out of nowhere. Which is a surprise if I would have known that coaches had armed themselves. <laughs> so just to give a big thanks to you. To everybody who had a part in that and um, and some new things that, that were thought of um, that you know you're seeing I don't know what are those things called again souls oh those are souls what else did, oh no the banner the yeah okay so and you'll have to show the pictures I mean just lots of new things and I you're seeing that when you see other graduation pictures um, and so you know I just thought it was awesome that you know State Fair Community College is you know, doing those celebratory things as well. Those things were Shelly and, and Holly getting and purchased, but the, the, the mace itself was impressive, which was made here with our equipment and our shop. Yes. And Justin. It's really uh, heavy. Right. Yes. It's extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Probably heavier than we expected. And where expected. is that stored? Then? Uh, it will be. It's in McDonald's right now, but it will be in the president's area here. So it can be able okay. to play all so the time. Kavania, I know you're going to want to see this. this. Dr. Time. Bates decides where you'd like it. We'll I'm yeah. going to make sure it's over here so it can be a full display all the time. Absolutely. The thing about the front display case, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll use it appropriately yeah. at our ceremonies. Good job well done. So, everybody, thank you. Anybody have anything else? Well, while we're meeting, is the opening of the Long Way Home mm -hmm. and synthesis exhibits at uh, the Dom Museum. And oh, yes. I had the opportunity to. Uh, attend the docents term uh, yesterday and I would highly, highly recommend uh, attendance during 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 the time that the, the exhibits are running. It's a really beautiful exhibit. I just on a personal note, I just want to say thanks for making a memorable graduation for me. Um, so appreciated. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And it shows that it was like $105 for one semester for 15 hours. Or for three days. All right. It does look like we need to do a date change uh, for the June meeting, Dr. Bates. The meeting originally scheduled conflicts with the MCCA trustee and executive leadership conference. We talked last time about would we be able to make it back? Everybody thought we could, so we thought we could go on, but our chief fund officer will be uh, off campus for that. So the big part of the June meeting will be approval of the budget, submission of the budget. He needs to load all that into the system and get all that shaped up. So he needs some time. So in order to take care of Keith, we're proposing to move that to June 29th. Go for, for Keith, I would like to. I will not be in state that week. I am out of state that entire week of June 24th through the 29th. 
that is the date, but uh, we'll find some of him. Convenient. <laughs> well, no, it's a well, like thirtieth. Oh, I wrote on both dates. I was practicing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I would entertain a motion. I'll move. Okay. We're here second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Justin, we'll keep you in, in the loop. I know it's the budget one too. Dang. True. It's the treasurer. Well, and you're gone most of the time. I'm just trying to think if there was a way to have you take a look at that ahead of time. But, but he might need the data, so I'm not sure if there's a way he can share that. Keep, I mean, Justin, we can sit down with you budget with you and answer any questions and prior to so we'd be happy the treasurer express it right the treasurer uh -huh. the yeah yeah if that, if that could be done done by the good value adjustments building opportunity and ability mm -hmm. to to look at the budget before before we have our time. Yeah. We're going to be in shape to give that that draft. So. Okay. All right. Anything else before um, we have um, a request for closed session? So, if not, we first want to say thanks to all of you for coming and being here this evening. It's still daylight, so wow, you've got a little bit of time to you know go do something for the evening. So, I would uh, entertain a motion. Uh, for hiring, firing, disciplining, and promotion of personnel pursuant to RSMO section 610.0213. So move to post our session. Second. Bill Carsey. Dean Brashear. Yes. Justin Hodge. Yes. Yes. Tom Oldham. Yes. Mr. Wood. Yes. Okay, so we Who would you like to stay? Uh, oh, thank you uh, for staying, uh, Keith, as well as Dr.